Welcome to Best Round, the show where three friends get together and break down their picks for the best movies ever made. I'm Chris. I'm Mickey. And I'm Steve. And this week we're talking Best Stallone Movies. <laughs> Why? We decided on Stallone flicks for this week's episode for a couple reasons. Number one, he's always been a big personal hero of mine. When some people get down, they need a little bit of alone time. Me, I need a little Stallone time. Also, we made this show to basically talk about 80s action movies and cult classic comedies, so what better way than to kick it off with one of the greatest action heroes of all time? Bring the heat, we each break down our honorable mentions and top picks. This week we're talking best Stallone movies. Steve, why don't you kick it off? Sure, sure. Alright, well, I'm going to give my first honorable mention to the movie Lords of Flatbush. And although this movie is not an easy watch necessarily, it did kick off Stallone's career. And uh, basically taking place in Brooklyn, 1958, where a group of high school friends essentially form a gang, including Stallone and the Fonz, Henry Winkler, right. is a part of this gang as well. Uh, you know, they're a greaser motorcycle, driving, troublemaking, uh, you know, gang of uh, guys who use their fists to solve all their problems. Uh, you know. <laughs> And also view young, uh, immature relationship and marriage issues along the way. That's not really much more you can say about this movie. Uh, uh, I'm sure you can. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I'm never lost for words, but uh, before I get in and uh, talk too much, uh, Mickey, what are your thoughts on Lords of Flatbush? Well, I think we can stop with the fact that uh, Henry Winkler is not a gang. <laughs> I, I think if, if we learned anything, Henry Winkler is definitely not kicking anybody's ass. So, I'm like, so I don't rate this movie very high. <laughs> the believe be, I can believe a lot of things, but like this is just uh, this is too far fetched for me that Henry Winkler is uh, in a gang. It is. A, it's a tough watch. It is. So, so I don't know. I think I just kind of like. Don't admit that when I can't talk more about this. <laughs> He's in a game with Ron Howard and Potsy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just feel like there's a shark somewhere, and it's gonna come out and eat them. It is like a less musically inclined Grease, uh, you know, without without any of the good story yeah. points of Grease. Yeah. And I I hated that movie too. So yeah. <laughs> really? Get hate your hate Greece? comments down below. I know. Right. But anyway. <laughs> All right, not a lot of love yet for Lords of Flatbush. Uh, directed by Martin Davidson, Betty and the Cruiser's fame, notable for introing the Fonz, as we said, Henry Winkler, and Stallone, whose credits prior to this film included The Party at Kitty and Studs and the Woody Allen film Bananas. But the most beloved part of this film for me is the fact that another actor from this film, Perry King, accidentally got the first Rocky greenlit without ever knowing about it. Long story short is when it came to crunch time money decision on whether or not to invest in a movie called Rocky starring an unknown actor named Sylvester Stallone, the investors watched this film to help decide whether Stallone was bankable or not. The problem is, when they were watching the movie, they didn't know which one was Stallone. The only one in the movie who looked like a movie star was Perry King. So one guy said, that's Stallone right there. Another producer said, but he's got blonde hair. This guy's supposed to be the Italian stallion. To which the first producer says, the guys from Northern Italy have blonde hair and blue eyes. And they decided to invest in Rocky. Might not be Stallone's best, but it was an important step on his journey to relevancy. So what's your number three pick, Mr. Fair enough. Let me take a look. All right, my number three pick, also uh, not necessarily the, the easiest uh, of watches, would be Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. All right? Yes. Now, I'm giving it that because Stallone's you know, intro to attempting comedies, uh, you know, it's kind of a, right? That was his first... This is his first comedy attempt, right? Uh, yeah, that would be yeah, his first right. foray, I believe, into the uh, comedy genre. I think it was also worth noting that he's quoted himself of saying that maybe this was one of the worst films in the entire solar system. Whatever. And this would include any alien productions we've yet to see. And that is a direct Stallone <laughs> quote after watching his own film, Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. I actually read that the other night, too. That was hilarious. But uh, playing another sergeant, as he does in so many of these takes that we uh, came across here. He plays Sergeant Joe Badowski, uh, you know, who breaks up a smuggling ring uh, against uh, young Ving Rhames, uh, which I think is incredible. Uh, and uh, uh, despite his the buddy cop uh, premise he has going with Estelle Getty of, you know, the Golden Girls. If you remember, she was, I think, I think Athea. She was the oldest Golden Girl. No, no, she was uh, Sophia. Sophia. Oh, so what did I say, yeah. Athea? Yeah, yeah, Sophia, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the Alpha oldest ghost girl, uh, playing Tootie. And Tootie witnesses a uh, murder, you know, and then has to live with him so that she has protection, you know, police protection. Uh, for, and, of course, the two of them together have to solve this murder. 
And uh, it's the only buddy cop movie that I've ever seen. Well, it's a mother and son dynamic. I think already people have way too much knowledge on this movie. <laughs> it needs to be there. I don't even know where to start with this. No. I, I, fan, not a fan. Let's start there. He's I, a fan, obviously. It's it's obviously, yeah. Uh, what did it say? Like, I, I mean, to be honest, this is the first time I saw Sophia without the gray hair. Really? Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't remember. I honestly mannequin. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But you know what? Honestly, like that was. I guess for me, before I saw her as Sophia, like when she saw Sof- her as Sophia, and like yeah, like you didn't know it was Estelle Getty. At least in my mind, I did like it. You know, when I saw Mannequin, I didn't know like oh that's Estelle Getty, because Golden Girls was not even there yet. Hmm. Correct. I guess. Yeah. Well. Well. Wait. When Mannequin came out, Golden Girls wasn't out yet. That's what you're saying. Yeah. I don't believe so. Uh, I guess you might be right, because Mannequin was like, what, 85 or 86? I don't know. We'll have to fact check that. Yeah. Anyways. Annotations. Anyway, so, uh, stop. No, stop. <laughs> stop. stop. <laughs> don't stop my mom will shoot. Just stop. All right, I'll make it brief for the sake of Mickey's sanity. Uh, how can you not love any film starring Sylvester Stallone and Estelle Getty? This is probably the one film that Stallone gets more shit for than anything else in his filmography. Personally, I'll take this over Rhinestone or Judge Dredd any day of the week. Apparently Stallone says Schwarzenegger actually tricked him into doing this by putting word out that he was interested in the script. I'm sure Stallone felt some kind of pressure to compete with the fact that Schwarzenegger and Reitman have been banking on films like Twins and Kindergarten Cop. There are things in this film that work and things that don't, but overall I think it's a fun, light comedy. I say two thumbs up. So, right. what is your number two pick? Right. My number two pick, to an actual kind of serious pick, is a movie I actually enjoy, which was called Tango and Cash. Uh, it was starring Stallone and uh, Kurt Russell. All right, it's another cut buddy cop movie. All right, and uh, the uh, mitzma- mismatched, the uh, mismatched LAPD duo work tirelessly to bring down this ruthless uh, drug lord. All right, who f- ends up framing them, and they wind up in uh, maximum security prison, which you know, makes total sense. <laughs> uh, where they have to deal with an uh, endless amount of inmates that they've previously incarcerated. Essentially. Um, this was actually a good movie. This is worth the watch. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Classic. Yeah. I don't know. What are your thoughts, Maggie? I mean, I like the movie. But yeah. I, I have to question why Stallone is always imprisoned. <laughs> right? A lot of his movies, he's in prison, or he's a cop, or something like that. He's always a cop. You're gonna, or, it's always, or he's, you know, or he's... going to have this reoccurring theme with Stallone movies. But in any event, I actually liked the movie a lot. I thought it was a fun little watch. It was good action. Uh, I thought, you know, the teamwork there or like you know the buddy cop thing I think they did well like you know so. they're a good dynamic yeah you know? yeah I thought, I thought it worked well so right, I'll go with this one I mean your other picks no not so much <laughs> but we'll go with this one uh, tell us about it Chris alright I'll start off by saying I'm a big fan of Wink Wink so I always love the line Rambo is a pussy Tango and Cash is a Stallone classic and a Kurt Russell classic all rolled up into one it's like Big Trouble and Little Cobra on steroids this film's literally jam-packed with awesome shit. You got guns, explosions, awesome one-liners, epic kills. You got ponytails, mullets, mustaches, and coke. You got badass henchmen, a prison break, a grenade down the pants, and the most badass truck in movie history. You got Stallone, Russell, Terry Hatcher, and Jack Palance all in their prime. How much more heat can you throw in that stew? This movie's cooking with some serious fire. I also just recently found out a little fun fact. Originally, Patrick Swayze was supposed to be in that movie. Really? I could see oh. that. Yeah, oh. but the ro- the problem was is he actually suffered like a knee injury, oh, I shit. guess like on Roadhouse or something, or prior or after Roadhouse. So he decided that he w- didn't want to do any more action movies for a little bit until his knee held up, and then he ended up doing Ghost. Oh yeah. my God, and we got robbed of a Stallone and Swayze team up? Yeah. Oh yeah. my God, that would be awesome. But we got Ghost out of it. We got Ghost out of it, but <laughs> I mean, come on, that could, I mean, no discredit to Kurt Russell, he's amazing. In Tango and Cash, but God, I want to see that like alternate universe where that's Stallone and Swayze. Right. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Kurt amazing. Russell's in Ghost. Yeah. Oh, that would be even <laughs> more amazing. Yeah. Whoa. I have to check the timeline as far as like Point Break or whatever like that, but mm. yeah. I guess his uh, injury was fine for that movie. Wow. Well, yeah, it must have been he was ready to jump out, of, actually jump out of airplanes for Point Break. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, Steve, what's your number one pick? All right. Well, my number one choice was. Demolition Man, all right. Where uh, he plays a uh, Stallone, 
obviously, plays another sergeant, Sergeant John Spartan, okay, who's cryogenically frozen back in the time, uh, back in, I guess what, it's supposed to be our time? Uh, I think he's frozen in futuristic 1997 or 1996 <laughs> yeah, at the yeah. time. Right. Uh, the Orwellian uh, dark dystopian future still version of 96. Still waiting for my automatic car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Along with Wesley Snipes, you know, who plays Simon Phoenix, uh, who winds up getting brought back in the future, you know, in this non non dystopian future, in this in this very very cleaned up, very uh, well well to do societal, you know structured future um, and he just starts rampaging snipes so they have to bring Stallone back from being cryogenically frozen as well because <laughs> he's the only man who could stop Simon Phoenix what what are you laughing at I'm um, just I love the way you recap these movies I it's know, very right? enjoyable for me I hope it's enjoyable for the viewers as well I hope so and uh, you know that's 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 pretty much that movie that, there's not much more to it than that but there's a lot of great action there's a lot of great one-liners. There's a lot of nonsense. Sandra Bullock's in it. She's fantastic in everything. She is fantastic in absolutely everything. No. Mickey, yeah. your thoughts? I absolutely love this movie. This movie was awesome from stop, start to finish, rather. And I feel like this was the precursor to Blade. I feel like Wesley Snipes... <laughs> That's an like, interesting... I don't yeah, know I mean, how you like, got there, uh, but... Well, here's... I'm going to yeah. tie it all. I'm going to bring it home in a second. I feel like Wesley Snipes' character in this movie was actually the prelude to, to Blade because you got that kind of like badass... Smart ass kind of acting thing going on there. So where he got the character, where he pulled, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, like, I mean, obviously we know Blade is a Marvel movie mm -hmm. or whatever it case may be, but I'm just a uh, comic book movie or whatever mm -hmm. that. But I, I'm just saying that um, I just feel like Wesley Snipes was the man, yeah. and I feel like he got a, like a lot of the stuff that he put into Blade was probably stuff that you could see, like you know, coming from Demolition Man. But I thought like the you know, Sandra Bullock is awesome too. So all in all, I think that's. Uh, it's a good pick. It's a good pick. Mm -hmm. You're right. I mean, I always kind of thought of movies like Passenger 57 as leading more towards Blade, but this really was in between, and this was kind of a step up to that level, I guess. That's a good point. Yeah, I never thought of it like, that way. That kind of outrageous character. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, this movie came out in the mid-90s when the market for guys like Stallone and Schwarzenegger had dried up substantially, and they had ceded significant ground to the next wave of Skull and Van Damme. But in a decade of drought, this film was a bright spot. I'll always remember the Taco Bell plug, which might go down as the most shameless product placement in movie history, but this movie is tons of fun, doesn't take itself too seriously, has some really funny lines, and a plot that moves along at a good brisk pace. Kudos to Sandra Bullock for doing the heavy lifting with lines like, Let's go blow this guy. And, You really licked his ass. Oddly enough, this film is also famous for its casting shakeups, as Sandra Bullock's role was originally cast as Laurie Petty, who was fired early in the production, and the script was written with Seagull and Van Damme in mind. But those two were in the midst of their endless feud, and they couldn't settle on who'd get top billing, so it never happened. I wouldn't say it's the best Stallone movie ever, but it's still a great, light, fun summer flick. And one of the biggest mysteries of my life will always be wondering how those three seashells work. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't know how to use the three seashells. <laughs> Like an idiot. No. Oh, um, I should say uh, something about I like your fucking Demolition Man headband, though, by the way. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'd be doing the viewers a disservice if I didn't draw attention to Steve's sequin John Spartan headband. It sparkles. Well, it's a little bit more screen accurate than my Rocky costume, so Mickey might win the coolness category with the Rambo headband. Any rate, moving on to your list, Mickey. What's your honorable mention? Honorable mention for me this week is going to be a film called Lock Up. And again, it's a Stallone in prison movie. So, uh, Theme of the day. <laughs> yeah. It might have actually have been the first Stallone in prison movie. I'm not sure. You have to fact, fact, you know, fact check that, but I think it was. That might be correct. Um, Unless but, you count the scene where he picks up Polly from prison in Rocky Three. <laughs> yeah, you could do that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. It's, I, I just feel it's like a cool prison flick. There's some cool action sequences, and it's just a Stallone classic. So all in all, that's why I just gave it as an honorable mention because it's just something that I think that everybody should just watch. So I dig that. Steve. I agree totally. You should definitely watch Lock Up if you get the chance. All right. Yeah. Anything else to say on Lock Up? No, I think you pretty much said it all. <laughs> Mickey said it's it all. Not, I mean, it's still Lords of Flap. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, digging. First shots fired. Yeah, Henry Winkler's not in Lock Up, I believe. Henry Winkler is not in Lock Up. That's correct. Right. <clears throat> Good. 
One of those films that attempt to show a softer side to Stallone, a bit more dramatic than action-packed, but not without its merits in general. This film introduced the world to one of the greatest batshit crazy actors to ever grace the screen in Tom Sizemore. You got a solid performance by Donald Sutherland, strong directing by John Flynn, who would later go on to direct Out for Justice and Brain Scan, cameo by Chuck Wepner, the real-life Rocky Balboa, and I feel like everyone from New Jersey knows that this movie was filmed at real-life Rawway State Prison, with real inmates as background extras. The script probably could have used another pass or two, but Stallone pulls it through and manages to stick the landing. It's a good movie. I wouldn't personally call it one of his best, but I definitely wouldn't call it one of his worst. So, moving on, what's your third pick? My third pick for this week is going to be Cobra. I absolutely love this movie. It's a cool, badass movie. You got Brigitte Nielsen in it, which is hot. Uh, uh, Stallone in cool ass shades. Stallone, again, as a cop, kicking ass. <laughs> so, these kind of like, it, it, I just feel like the scripts where Stallone's a cop or he's in prison are the best. So. <laughs> We're gonna go hey, with that. Stick to what works. This is uh, this is by far his coolest role. He does play he does yeah. play the coolest role I've seen Stallone, and or whatever like the most just genuinely badass like give no fucks like he's shipping beers you know with the gun in his hand you know what I mean waiting for them to run out of bullets before he turns and you know takes them all out like could be he's like shit like that he's he's definitely yeah pretty much Cobra and Rambo yeah, it's yeah. the two coolest roles yeah, yeah. for sure guy is shooting bad guys in a bar. With shades on. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's and not right. missing. Yeah. So. While chewing on a match. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Uh, being as honest as I can, I actually feel like Cobra is a bad movie that I absolutely love anyways. And the origin of this movie is actually a really fascinating 80s lore to me. It started when Paramount Pictures was trying to get a movie made called Beverly Hills Cop. Even though it was written as an action comedy with Eddie Murphy in mind, they tried to shop it around town and it drew interest from Stallone. He reworked the script, changing the name of the character from Axel Foley to Axel Colbretti, calling him the Motor City Cobra, putting in tons of action, blah blah blah, etc. Eventually, Paramount decided to go back towards a more comedic direction, and Stallone graciously bowed out. In turn, he took all the stuff he wrote for Beverly Hills Cop and expanded it into Cobra. This movie is 80s action at the core, and was originally so extreme it took several re-edits to avoid an X rating, leaving a ton of footage on the cutting room floor. Directed by George P. Cosmodos of Rambo First Blood Part 2, but legend has it Stallone was the actual director of the film. The movie was a success, but not on the level of Rocky IV and First Blood Part II. For me, it's a pretty mixed bag. It takes itself way too seriously, which is half of why it's awesome, but also half of why it's not quite as much fun as some of the other classic Stallone flicks to me. Still a great, dark, gritty, 80s Stallone action movie, though. So, what's your number two pick? Number two pick is going to be the classic Rocky IV. And why I chose that is, again, it's a classic movie. Classic good versus evil movie. Uh, you have an awesome soundtrack. I mean, if anybody wants to get motivated to hit the gym <laughs> or, like, do life in the best way possible, throw on Rocky IV soundtrack and you're doing it right. Yeah, if you're looking to just live to the fullest, that is the soundtrack of choice. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And Drago, obviously, one of the baddest-ass villains that I feel that, you know, Stallone has had in any of his movies. Oh, for sure. Um, it's just a classic, you know, USA versus Russia theme going on, too. I mean, I could talk forever. And also, Brigitte Nielsen. Brigitte Nielsen's fantastic. Starting to see some patterns in these <laughs> movies here. They either in prison, Brigitte Nielsen, or. Uh, well, I mean, that's not me. That's, that's Stallone. That's right. Stallone, that's so, true. Stallone basically is writing, directing all these movies, and he just says, like, let me put Brigitte Nielsen and let me make myself a cop. Right. Yeah. Uh, something tells me I won't be seeing Oscar on your list later on. A disgraced, a disgraced cop. Or a, uh, an inmate. Yeah. Oh, God. Um, it is definitely, Rocky Ford is definitely uh, classic patriot porn. But like it's fullest, it, it 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 brings it to that level. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I literally don't know a single person who's under fifty whose favorite Rocky movie is anything other than Rocky Four. Even though the film was ahead of its time, it's the most perfect time capsule of nineteen eighty five that's ever been created. The bad guys were Russians, the hairstyles were flawless, the villain punches machines to train, and the family pet is a robot that mysteriously disappeared in between Rocky Four and Five. There's even a fucking montage of Stallone driving a Lamborghini, thinking about his life cut to 80s synth rock. <laughs> this movie's got like 97 of the best training montages ever put to the silver screen. While Drago's taking steroids and punching computers, Rocky's out in the cold basically chopping down trees with his dick. Carl Weathers is red hot fire as Apollo Creed in this movie. Like, he's so fucking cool, I don't even think Drago kills him. I think he cools his way into another dimension. And the soundtrack kicks, kicks absurd amounts of ass. 
Robert Tepper, James Brown, John Cafferty, Survivor, and one of the most underrated composers of all time. Vince DiCola steps in and does an, the impossible on this movie by being a worthy, albeit temporary, successor to the incredible Bill Conti. His synth-driven score gave the movie the extra boost that it needed. Arguably Stallone's best directorial work, Burt Young's best performance as Pauly. What else can you say about this movie? 1985 was peak Stallone. After restarting and winning the Vietnam War in May of 85 with Rambo First Blood Part 2, he ended the Cold War in November of 85 with Rocky IV. Thank you, Stallone, for your service to the world. <laughs> Moving to the top of your list, what's your number one pick? Well, of course, speaking of the top, I have to go with Over the Top. <laughs> that is my favorite Stallone movie of all time. I know some people are looking at me weird right now. <laughs> no. But the reality is it's Stallone as a dad. First time that I can remember seeing him as a dad. I mean, obviously, I mean, if you take into consideration Rocky II. No, and three. Maybe. And four. And three. Yeah, 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 true. So I was wrong on that aspect. <laughs> no, no, but, no. Uh, you're not. You're not. But, I mean, no. like, he's actually, like, you know, a bad dad. Yeah. You know, so, dad. yeah, so that's a different twist on the dad role. Uh, you have a Terry Funk cameo, which, you know, for all you wrestling fans out there, is classic. Uh, and... A movie about arm wrestling, which had never been done before. So only Stallone can make a movie about arm wrestling interesting. <laughs> so on those merits alone, I got to give this movie like the top praises. <laughs> the only downfall of this movie is the kid in this movie, which gets annoying after a while, but it all works out in the end. You make some good points. I can't imagine this movie actually being watchable with anyone other than Stallone in it. But, uh, Steve, what are your thoughts on Over the Top? I love how you guys laughed at the premises behind all of my picks and then wound up with number one, Over the Top. He's, he's <laughs> a truck driver who's trying to trying to rekindle his, his you know relationship with his son by driving him cross-country and showing him how great of an arm wrestler he is. That's... <laughs> So look at me, it's not my pick. Well, I'm just saying. I, mean, I, you know, I, know. I, I like I, I like Over the Top. I'm, I, I'm with you. Oh, I love it. Yeah, it's a great but, movie. I mean, I know we can never compare it to Estelle Getty. And <laughs> <laughs> no. Dang. Oh, but, um, man. Shots <laughs> fired again. It's true. I, love I, it. I like Over the Top. I'd, give, I'd get into it. I'd watch it again with you guys. Hey, this is what Bringing the Heat's all about, folks. Mm. I gotta admit, I was very surprised to learn that you think Over the Top is the best Stallone movie of all time. I totally love this movie, but definitely in the it's so bad, it's good kind of way. I'll start with the positives. The fact that there's a character that exists named Lincoln Hawk is amazing. It's right up there with Johnny Utah on the list of amazingly awesome bad movie character names. It's not poorly directed for a movie about a truck driver reuniting with his estranged son and helping him cope with the death of his mother by teaching him how to arm wrestle. It's got a fairly okay shady soundtrack, some decent Stallone stare downs, solid villainish characters, but anytime you put Robert Loja on screen, it's never a bad thing. Even if he has to play the lame duck role of rich grandfather who is basically a villain, but not really. Like, he's just a rich dude who cares about his grandson. He just lost his daughter. He tries to buy Stallone out of his son's life, but other than that, it's more of an awkward obstacle in a movie that goes off the rails pretty quickly. Ironically, this movie was made by Canon Films, who up to that point stuck to a very strict business model. Don't ever make a $30 million movie. Make 30 movies that cost $1 million each. One of them works and it pays for all the others. After finding success with that model, but still being treated like outsiders in Hollywood, Ken studio heads Menahem Golan and Yoram Globus wanted desperately to be part of the in-crowd. So they broke from their own business model and offered Stallone more and more and more and more money until he eventually said yes to Over the Top. And that was the first death blow to Canon Films. Two of their next films, like Over the Top, proved too much for them to handle as Superman 4 and Masters of the Universe both flopped horribly. Rumor has it Canon ran out of cash so fast, both those films were released practically as work prints, with an incredible amount of unfinished VFX shots. As much as I love this film, as bad as it is, it does bum me out a bit that this killed one of the greatest independent studios of all time. You definitely get points for boldness with this pick, though. Alright, Chris, how about yourself? What's your honorable mention? My honorable mention is 1988's Rambo 3. Before I get too in-depth on it, I figured I'd give you guys a chance to talk about it first. Steve, your thoughts? Sure. Uh, speaking back to Patriot porn, that's the one most to... Was to be a part of, so often. What is it? Rambo three was uh Rambo three was where they brought him back into back into war. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Well, one yeah. of the times you know, they brought him back. What into an actual war about? Into an actual war, right? Into an actual war, not a fictionalized restarted Vietnam. Know. Yeah, war. I'm a fan of all the Rambos. They kind of all they kind of all blend together to me a little bit, but yeah, they're good movies. Mickey, how about you? 
I love Rambo 3. I mean, Ram, uh, all the Rambo movies, like like you said, they, they do tend to, like, you know, blend the together, but, I mean, that's why we love them. That's true. Because yeah. they're basically really well-done sequels. Yeah. So, I love the premise. I always love Rambo kicking ass. And there's always always a hot girl that, like, somehow he meets or whatever. <laughs> yeah. so there's, no, there's no hot girl in Rambo 3. There's literally, like, almost no women in the movie at all. Really? Yeah, there's very few women in the, in the entire film. Wasn't Rambo 3 the one that... No, Rambo 2 is the one where he meets... uh... You take me with you? Alright, I retract everything I said about Rambo 3. (laughs) No, I'm just saying. I'm just saying, I I feel like the movie... There could have been a hot girl. Uh, Maybe they cut her out, I don't know. Um, But anyway, I love Rambo 3 anyway, so I I thought all the Rambo movies are, are... Awesome fun flicks to watch, and it's uh, Stallone kicking ass. Mm. Yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, touching on that, uh, like kind of like you guys said, the Rambo series to me is one of those incredibly rare instances where there isn't a single installment that's anything less than amazing. In the case of Rambo 3, not only does this film not get enough respect, but the time of its release, Stallone caught some pretty heavy flack in the media, which I'll get into in a second. The first Rambo raised awareness about the way our Vietnam vets were treated when they got home. The second film drew attention to the fact that there were still American POWs in prison in Vietnam. And the third film drew attention to a war that had largely been ignored by Western media, the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. The brutal realities of this horrible war portrayed honestly on screen. The Israeli actors that make up the cast of Afghan rebels do an incredible job representing the passion and heroics of the real-life freedom fighters that their characters are based on. This film is incredibly huge and amazingly violent. At one point, it was even in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most violent film ever made, with 221 acts of violence and 108 deaths. The film started production under the direction of Russell McCahey of Highlander fame, but he was quickly fired by Stallone and replaced with one of the most accomplished second-unit directors in Hollywood history, Peter McDonald. McDonald does an incredible job with this film and delivers a timeless blend of hardcore 80s violence and David Lean epic, accomplishing all of this with only one day to prepare. Cast and crew suffered under an insanely brutal desert sun that was so hot it melted the film and the camera on several occasions. Stallone gives what I feel is his best performance as John Rambo, combining the DIY MacGyver vibe of the first film with the over-the-top badassery of the second, and adding one of the most majestic cinematic mullets the 80s ever created. And this film features the return of one of the coolest weapons in movie history, the exploding arrow tips. And this time, they're taking down fucking helicopters. This film should have been a bigger financial success, it should have launched Peter McDonald as an A-list Hollywood director, and it should have been a huge win for Stallone. But it was the victim of bad timing and political circumstance, something like four weeks before the release of this film, the Soviets started to withdraw their troops from Afghanistan, and all of a sudden Stallone was accused of villainizing the Russians, who were supposed to be our new friends. And it kind of took some steam out of the release. Stallone's career is full of gold, so it's only my honorable mention here, but it's one of the best 80s action movies ever made, and one of the best part threes of all time, and I'll also say it's the most underrated film in Stallone's arsenal. Moving on to my number three pick, we have the original 1976 Rocky. And once again, before I get too in depth, you guys, what are your thoughts? The original? I I, I love the original. It is a dark and gritty and weird and kind of artsy view on, on on the Rocky, you know, in the Rocky franchise. He's you know he's he's almost mentally challenged seeming. You know, Adrian's like a weird fucking recluse shut in. You know, uh, and it's definitely like I said, kind of dark and kind of. I don't know, kind of weird. I liked it. I liked it a lot. <laughs> the student yeah. analysis, maybe. I, I kind of almost feel like you know, with the with the Rocky movies, it's, it's kind of funny the the way like after like after two, hmm. Rocky all of a sudden learns how to speak eloquently. He <laughs> learns how to like you know be in society and like be like a, a upstanding citizen and, and all this. Like they do show the... him learning to read too. At least <laughs> like a two percent credibility <laughs> to it. True. All like the like the the, the scruff and you know scruff and rough or whatever like that you want to say is gone and like he's all of a sudden like you know GQ smooth and stuff like that. But anyway, but I don't. And like, your I mean, pick, he's practically speaking before the UN. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he's giving speeches and stuff like that. It's only like and then and then we get to like part five where he then learn you know forgets how to talk again and back in the streets of Philly and you know and all that good stuff. But anyway, um. It's a classic movie. I mean, Rocky, you know, won an Oscar for a reason. It's just timeless and just a classic movie. Mm. Absolutely. (laughs) Not only is this the film that started it all for Stallone, cemented John Avelson at the top of the film world, but it created the modern Hollywood underdog and brought forth one of the most important tools in the history of filmmaking, Garrett Brown's Steadicam. 
This movie is like a perfect storm of elements that came together beautifully. An amazing script, a budding young director, a movie star in the making, an incredible sporting cast, an eloquent and inspiring Bill Conti score, a timeless love story, an underdog city, an independent spirit, and an original voice. Talia Shire, Carl Weathers, Burt Young, and Burgess Meredith all give top shelf performances, and there's even a cameo by my personal hero, Lloyd Kaufman. The characters and their motivations are clear but not contrived. Audiences are rooting for Rocky from the minute he walks Little Marie home, and 40 years later, they never stopped. The story of how this film got made is as much of an underdog story as the film itself. Stallone wrote the script when he was dirt poor and everyone in Hollywood wanted to buy it, but no one wanted to let him star in it. He stuck to his guns, found financing, and with a shoestring budget he made a film that won Best Picture, Best Director, and Stallone himself was even nominated for Best Actor. If this film was never made, there'd be no Rocky Balboa, no John Rambo, no Stallone as we know him, no Karate Kid as we know it, and possibly no Schwarzenegger, Seagal, Van Damme as we know them as well. This series launched Stallone, Mr. T, Hulk Hogan, and Dolph Lundgren, and we owe it all to the seeds planted in the very first Rocky film. Moving on to my number two pick, we have 1982's First Blood. Before I get into this one again, give you guys a chance to talk about it first. What do you guys think? The original? Uh, I don't have I don't have a lot to throw out there on First Blood. Yeah, I, I liked it as a movie. It's it's not it didn't really it didn't really move my meter. Really? Necessarily? Yeah. 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 I mean, it is it is what it is. It's a good movie. Fair I don't enough. know if I'd put it up as a number two pick of. Stallone's best of all time, but well, you know, it's no Lords of Flatbush, you know, but uh, <laughs> yeah, again, or a stop on my mom's shoe. <laughs> yeah, what was your number two again? Uh, Tango and Cash. Yeah, okay, fair yeah. enough. I, I can't shit on Tango and Cash. Uh, Mickey, your thoughts on the original First Blood? I, I love First Blood. I mean, I, like I said, I love all the Rambo movies. The, the most memorable thing I can remember about the Rambo movies, or like one of the coolest thing about the Rambo movies, was that it, it generated that Rambo Sega Genesis game or Nintendo game. Oh yeah, yeah. Which oh, I there's a couple of those were yeah, good, yeah. Which yeah. I absolutely loved playing that game. I would play that game like all night long. Never beat it, but it was still fun to shoot a bunch of stuff. PS3 <laughs> was actually not half bad either. Hmm. Came out a couple years ago. I never played that one. It's a little, it's a little frustrating at times, but it's a pretty solid game. Huh. Um, my thoughts on First Blood. Uh, obviously, you know, I have a couple of those. Um, <laughs> even though Rocky One put Stallone on the map, and Rocky Two proved he wasn't a flash in the pan, Stallone struggled for years to find a commercial and critical success outside the Rocky series. That all changed, along with the action genre forever, once 1982's First Blood hit the silver screen. Based off David Morrell's groundbreaking novel, the script for First Blood was considered to be as cursed as just about anything in Hollywood. After a decade of almost getting made, with various stars joining and leaving the project, First Blood was eventually pitched to Stallone. He was so hesitant, knowing how long the project had been kicked around, that he initially declined the offer to star in the film. However, he did accept an offer to take a pass at retooling the script, and it was at that point that he fell in love with the character and the project. After Stallone signed on to star, Kirk Douglas was hired to play Colonel Troutman, but he demanded that Rambo die at the end of the movie, insisting it was the more artistic choice. Stallone felt that, that would send the wrong message to actual veterans, essentially telling them that death is the only answer. So the two parted ways, and Richard Crenna stepped in and killed it as Troutman. Brian Dennehy slays it as Teasel, the asshole cop with a boner for drifters like Rambo. There's actually a great subtext between Teasel and Rambo that Teasel was a Korean War veteran, and in addition to being the Forgotten War, there's a bit of a, you know, I didn't come back all long-haired and fucked up from my war kind of attitude. If you look at their acting styles, it's a beautiful clash of opposite methods that sells the reality of their conflict. This may have been the first modern thinking man's action movie, and it manages to be one of the most badass films of all time, with a body count of only one. It launched a thousand imitators, good and bad, and I wouldn't trade a single one of them for the world. This film is the exact moment Stallone went from temporary movie star to permanent American icon. Moving on to my number one pick, we have James Mangold's 1997 masterpiece, Copland. Once again, before I get into it too heavily in depth, guys, what are your thoughts? I loved Copland. I thought it was a great movie. Um... I love it's another Stallone movie where he's playing a cop. Is he a sergeant in this one? Oh, uh, he's a sheriff. <laughs> oh, he's a sheriff. That's right. Sheriff in Copland. Um, <laughs> sheriff of Copland. But this Mickey. time he's an overweight cop. He's, he's an overweight That's cop. Right. That's right. That's Which right. is just a sheriff. Yeah, that makes sense. That. Um, Which is really just a sheriff. Yeah. He had to change it up somewhere. Right? The sergeants he played are naturally. Everyone knows sergeants are in shape and, yeah. you know. Detectives uh, sheriffs, are in shape. Yeah, yeah detectives are in shape. Sheriffs are, you know. Green Berets are in shape. Sheriffs yeah, are not Sheriffs, so no, not at all. I don't know. Biggie, what are your thoughts? Those are good. I thought it was a great movie. I love Copland. I mean, that's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> it's all right. In depth analysis. You heard it here first, folks. Yeah. Um, for me, I mean, where to even begin with this masterpiece of a film? 
Written and directed by the incredibly talented and then largely unknown James Mangold, who would later go on to wow the comic book world with the masterpiece that is Logan. Mangold assembled one of the most incredible casts in the history of film. Sylvester Stallone, Ray Liotta, Harvey Keitel, Robert De Niro, Peter Berg, Robert Patrick, Janine Garofalo, Michael Rappaport, and no less than five actors that would go on to breakout roles in HBO's The Sopranos. A modern-day western set in a small New Jersey town, this film centers on the story of Sheriff Freddie Hufflin, who always dreamed of crossing the bridge in New York and becoming a city cop. Fortunately for Freddie, the fact that he's deaf in one ear curbed his chances of joining the NYPD, and he's stuck being a sheriff in the small town of Garrison, New Jersey. A town that is occupied almost entirely by New York cops. As you might expect, a great deal of these cops are corrupt, letting the mob run drugs to their precinct to have their nice New Jersey homes financed by mob banks. Robert De Niro's Mo Tilden includes Stallone in on what's really going on in his town, and Stallone sets off on a mission to peel back the veneer and discover the truth about Copland. Aided by De Niro's outstanding mustache and Ray Liotta's incredible drunken speeches, the plot unfolds beautifully and builds all the way to one of my favorite third act climaxes in movie history. Stallone gives the performance of his career, breaking from every single stereotype we know about him. He worked for Screen Actors Guild minimum salary, he gained 40 pounds of fat for the role, and instead of playing the cocky badass who art smarts the villains, he's the shy fat guy who's always three steps behind. Every actor in this film is at the top of their game, from Keitel's scene-stealing speeches to Stallone's quiet struggle, Ray Liotta building mountains of acting out of spilled beer, and De Niro telling Stallone, And you blow it! This is one of the most well-acted films of the 90s. The chemistry between any two actors sharing any scene in this film is absolutely electric, especially in a scene where Ray Liotta shoves a dart up Robert Patrick's nose. After filming that scene, Liotta got in Patrick's face and famously said, Take that, Terminator! Released in 1997, the film was well hyped and expected to be the next Pulp Fiction. But the movie was dumped in a late August release, and in addition to being a dark and depressing, whereas Pulp Fiction is fun and exciting, Stallone had been coming off a string of subpar efforts The Specialist, Judge Dredd, Assassins, and Daylight. Copland may not have made Pulp Fiction money, and it got overlooked come Oscar time, but the movie lived on as a cult legend beloved by film nerds everywhere. You'd be a Stallone <laughs> character for a day. Who would you be? Uh, Rocky after the money. Rocky after so the Rocky money. after the money. Pretty good. Everything else he does, he's, he's getting shot at all the time. And he's, yeah, that's true. Yeah. He's like rich right. and successful. And like right, so you just want like... You, I just you, want Rocky's <laughs> money. Yeah. You just want the fame but, 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 the but, robot. <laughs> but, but, okay, but then you have to fight the Russian. You have to fight Drago. You gotta fight uh, uh, oh, fucking Drago. Well, I don't want to do that. I either. think he's only talking about like Rocky in the first act. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to be Rocky in the Lamborghini Montage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, when he dreams, yeah, when he's he just thinking about life. Okay. Yeah. The only yeah. thing that's bad that's going on is his best friend just died. Yeah. Right. Well, that's, yeah. I mean, I don't think there's any like like I mean like there's I'm, no good Rocky character or good Rocky good good Stallone character that you'd want to be. The guy in Oscar was super rich and successful. <laughs> So the votes are in, and we've concluded that the best Stallone movies ever made are Rocky IV, Copland, and Demolition Man, which somehow wound up scoring the most points of all the movies on this list. That pretty much wraps it up for best Stallone flicks. Once again, I'm Chris. I'm Mickey. And I'm Steve. Be sure to tune in next week when we're talking about best John Cusack movies. Later, guys.